everyone and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub online. Uh, tonight's event is hosted by us, a collective group of Skeptics in the Pub organisers who are providing a weekly social and engaging alternative to in-person events during the pandemic. If you've never heard of scepticism before, the goal of scepticism is to try and apply some critical thinking to all sorts of aspects of the world and our lives to make decisions based in evidence. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, um, just to let you know how the night's going to work, Firstly, if you're using the Twitch stream on a computer, phone or tablet device, you can join in the chat, which you'll see down the side or underneath. Use that space to chat to the rest of the audience, say hello, let us know where you're watching from and what you're drinking. And we want the chat to be a safe space for everyone, so please try to keep it polite and respectful and respect our mods if they ask you to adjust your tone slightly to keep things friendly and social. Um, our speaker will talk for around 45 minutes to an hour, and then we'll have a short break for you to refresh your drink, stretch your legs, use the bathroom. Um, during the talk, if you, if you head to uh, sli.do forward slash internet, you can ask questions, upvote the questions you want to see answers, answered, and the link will be shared uh, on the screen and in the chat at regular intervals. You can also go to our PayPal to make a donation if you like what we're doing, um, and the link for that will be on your screen or in the chat too. After we have a break, um, we'll bring back our speaker to answer as many of your questions as we can, uh, as we can get through in a reasonable time. We'll try to prioritise those that have been upvoted, so make sure you vote for your favourites. And after the talk, you can join us in our Zoom pub, the Lockins Razor, to chat, relax, socialise, and the link will be shared for that in the chat box later on. Our moderators will be available in the chat for the whole event, and they'll be organisers in the Zoom chat after the event. But if you do have any problems you'd like to discuss privately with us, you can email us at skeptics.online at gmail.com. And if you experience any form of harassment, bullying, or interactions that make you feel uncomfortable, please let us know. Next week's event is Izzy Lawrence. We'll be talking about velociraptors and suffragettes. Um, but this week, let me introduce our speaker for tonight, James Ball. And um, James is an author, is author of The System, Who Owns the Internet and How It Owns Us. He is the global editor of the Bureau of In Investigative Journalism and writes and broadcasts freelance, and he's a col columnist for The New European. James is a special correspondent for BuzzFeed UK and special projects editor for The Guardian. He was involved in Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of the NSA leaks by Edward Snowden and lots of other similar stories. And he was involved with WikiLeaks. So join me in thanking and welcoming James to your screens with lots of clap emojis in the chat window. So hi there. Um, this is the very unnerving experience for me of uh, talking to my computer, but uh, being told that this time actually someone really is listening. So uh, fingers crossed that's true. Um, I kind of want to chat about sort of who really runs the Internet, because Every single day we hear about Facebook, Apple, Amazon and Google in some different combination and usually being told that they are ruining the world in some way or making record profits or have record number of users. And of course, they are by market cap four of the five largest companies in the world, uh, largest listed companies in the world. Um, the missing one in the top five being Microsoft, who's hardly absent from technology. And so we talk about them sort of every day. We have these sort of debates. Should we split them up? Should we do all of this kind of stuff? But we never really seem to talk about, well, why are they so big? How did they get so big? And why does the Internet keep creating these sort of very near monopolies sort of all over the place? What is it about the Internet that may, means that all of the companies got so big? You know, what is it that means it's so kind of winner take all and so driven on data? And I kind of felt like while we were always looking at this stuff happening right up at the very top the, with the companies that we actually interact with, we never sort of looking at what it is about the underlying technology of the Internet that is making these huge, huge winners or what's making the sort of data economy work as it does. And so, you know, I think hopefully, fittingly enough for a sort of skeptics audience, I wanted to sort of poke around in some of the bits of the internet that we don't really look at, um, you know, it's sort of the layers below it to try and sort of get that question of, well, why is it got like this? And why does no one really seem to have a grip on it? Why does, you know, is it just that lawmakers don't understand anything more complicated than a pocket calculator? Or is it that, you know, is it that they're global companies or is it that there's something intrinsic to how the technology works that's driving it? And so obviously 
did lots of this for the research for the book, but I largely sort of just decided to try and go and meet people who'd been involved at different stages of the internet's kind of evolution. And a lot of it sort of came down to what happened in 1969 when ARPANET, the sort of network that became the internet, was conceived of. And, you know, the internet's about to turn 51-ish. Um, and that means the people who created it are largely still alive. And you can go and sort of talk to them about it. And, of course, you can read about it. And it sort of didn't really come out of this massive demand from anyone for some kind of network. It wasn't really this huge idealistic project. Universities wanted more computing time. And a lot of universities were getting research funding from the Advanced Research Projects Agency, you know, ARPA or DARPA, which was a subset of the US Department of Defense. And this is back when computers were room-sized affairs and worked by batch processing. You know, you would write whatever code you wanted it to execute, you know, sometimes still on punch cards and sort of join it to the queue 24 hours later, come back and hope that you hadn't mangled whatever instruction you were putting in. Um, and so computers were sort of in huge demand and people wanted more of them and people wanted computers sometimes with different capabilities. Some were more suited to graphical calculations, some more suited to certain types of physics. And so people would put in requests to ARPA for more computers. And ARPA, for its own reasons, essentially said, no, we won't give you more computing, but we will give you money to join up your computer with those of a few other universities. And we want you to sort of research and test some networking technologies. And so four US universities got funding and signed up to this kind of project to build ARPANET. And this was the technology that became the internet, but it also was essentially testing out this kind of fundamental new concept, which was sort of sending information by packets. And this is still how everything online works today. You know, whatever you're sending, whether it's the video that I'm transmitting now, whether it's an email, whether it's a file, whether it's just plain text, everything essentially gets split up into thousands and millions of little envelopes of information that are almost sort of just numbered, you know, one of 200 and then sent out. And largely to the internet, a packet is a packet is a packet. Nothing between the computers cares about what's in that. This was completely revolutionary in the sense of every network before it was incredibly specialized and loved to charge you based on what you were doing. This was in the era where if you plugged an answer phone onto your phone, you would pay extra to your phone provider, uh, which, you know, who knew in the, in the 60s, phone companies were extortionists. Uh, lucky that we live in a world that's very different today. And so they sort of knew the potential for this kind of lightweight network that you could then build more technologies on. But really, most of the sort of subject heads and the people running the project, aside from one or two of the professors who were actually into networking, this was sort of a sideshow. This might help them look at their real research interest, but, you know, they just wanted people to get on with it. And so it was basically the details of how to do it were handed down to the very, very lowest levels of university life, by which, of course, I mean grad students, and even in some cases, undergrads, and you know if undergrads are getting trusted with a project, it's not the top of anyone's list. And so they were really trying to keep everything really lightweight. They didn't have to worry about billing. They didn't care how far packets were traveling because the US government was footing the bills. They knew that it needed to work by this sort of very lightweight, just switching packets and sending them down, down the line. And they also sort of had to work out how to make rules and agree how things would work with each other when none of them really had any status. And the guy who kind of came up with 
what we now call a protocol for handling kind of rules of the internet was a guy called Steve Crocker, who I met in a horrible coffee shop in Maryland. Um, and he essentially said, you know, he'd come up with sort of how some particular bit would work and needed to circulate it. And he couldn't really think of what to put on the top of it. You know, he couldn't call it a sort of instruction or a memo because that might set everyone else's backs up. So he called it a request for comment, um, which is now RFCs, which are still how the instructions on different protocols of the internet are set, set out. So they tried to keep this network very lightweight, very extendable, but they didn't really have to worry about anything like security or about identity. Um, they sort of fixed problems as they went along. If someone sort of took the network down, they could phone someone at one of the other three institutions, or as it grew, it was 20 and then sort of 50 or 100, almost all U.S. military or U.S. sort of universities. And so this was a trusted network. It was a research network. It was never kind of infrastructure. And they never really thought about building into the protocols, the sort of very foundational level of what became the Internet, anything that might track identity, for example. And this did mean the network wasn't only extendable in terms of adding more computers. It meant you could add more technologies to it. You know, email came along not many years later. You then started getting things like FTP, which let you share files. And, of course, quite famously, the web came along when Tim Berners-Lee kind of conceived it as a project in 1989. But these protocols were sort of built and extended as they went along. Um, the system for resolving IPs into internet addresses, you know, initially they kind of, they ran out of their allocation of addresses. I think they'd only allowed for about 256 computers to be on the network at first and realized they'd made a calamitous mistake and would have to redo the whole sort of IP address system of the internet and so they made it so it would be able to have 4 billion IP addresses, you know, a laughably high number that they would never reach, um, you know. And then, of course, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, they realized they were very much going to reach it and had to redo IP then. But they made it lightweight. They made it extendable. They didn't worry about security. They didn't worry about these things. And they kind of succeeded beyond their wildest dreams but very slowly and then very quickly the internet sort of 20 years after it was conceived was still largely academic still dominated by the us and didn't really roll out into the commercial world until the 1990s and so then huge parts of what made the internet good and interesting started to plant the seeds for what went wrong a bit later and sort of getting into why these things sort of became tricky. Oh, an interesting aside before I move on from this era was um, this sort of packet switching idea is part of where the old sort of slight urban myth about the Internet once being intended to do the U.S.'s nuclear missile control came about. It's not entirely false. Um, if you want a second strike nuclear weapon capability, you want to be absolutely sure that you can send a message to your launch sites. Now, packet switching, which lets sort of data try and flow along multiple routes, is a much better option for that than traditional sort of comms lines would have been. But you don't really want to first test a networking technology on anything connected to, you know, missile heads. Now, I'm not an expert on defense matters, but that seems pretty wise. And so... What they did was try and sort of find a low priority networking situation to sort of road test the technology a bit. So then if it worked, they could look at an implementation that they could use in much more secure military contexts. So it was related to experiments connected to the nuclear weapon system, but no one really quite intended to uh, hook up nukes to ARPANET, which... Uh, is probably the one sort of small blessing sort of from that particular Cold War era. So some of these protocols that sort of run the internet 
people knew weren't really fit for purpose years and years and years ago. And one of my kind of favorite examples for this is something called Border Gateway Protocol, which I'm probably going to mangle and try to do a simple explanation of. So really sorry to anyone who specializes in this. But basically, it's sort of roughly like a how transponders guide airplanes. It's the thing that kind of goes, hey, I've got a route that gets you nearer to where you want to go. Travel via me. And it governs which physical cables data sort of flows down to get to its destination. And, you know, what routes at different times signal that they might be good. And there's the inevitable cat entrance. Sorry. So I don't think they need to see your butt, buddy. Thank you. So I'm sorry about that. Um, and so they knew the way that this data was sort of being traveled as far back as the 80s. They weren't very happy with it. And no one seems to be coming up with a good workable solution. So at a conference in the canteen, two engineers uh, essentially sketched a solution on the back of either two or three napkins. Uh, they can't quite agree how many, and no one thought to keep them for posterity. And they knew that this would not be a good long-term solution, but they thought it might be a good stopgap for a year or two. Um, and of course, sort of some 30 years down the line, BGP is still how we govern sort of sending traffic across the internet. Now, BGP is an interesting example of why we need to worry about these protocols and this kind of foundation layer below the sort of visible internet, because there's a very famous um, example of it going wrong uh, related to a Pakistani government order and YouTube. And this is quite an old one. This is from 2008. And it was when Pakistani authorities wanted to ban one specific anti-Muslim video and sort of point people instead to a, a page from the internet service provider going, hey, you know you're not meant to be trying to watch this stuff. And mistake one was that the ISP basically decided just to apply this to the entirety of YouTube. But they decided to implement the order using BGP. And they essentially signaled a false route. They meant to signal to everyone using their ISP, hey, I've got a brilliant route to YouTube.com. It's here. And it was a fake route that instead took you to this page telling you off for viewing the video. The problem was they were in the kind of trusted core of BGP providers and sort of it promulgated out not just to their users, but to users across the internet. And as other ISPs started updating sort of where to go for YouTube, they started getting, I think, around sort of about half to two thirds of the internet started thinking that this was the new brilliant route to YouTube. And so YouTube went down for sort of you know millions and millions and millions of internet users and so it's quite subject to exploit and there's only so much you can do to update the protocol because even if people agree it this is on maybe about a billion devices around the world and how do you update some of these devices some of which are quite old some of which are quite sort of you know hard to access etc and would keep interoperable and so you're sort of stuck with trying to rebuild a spaceship when you're halfway through the cosmos other protocols get even sort of more complex sort of the the system that decides which ip address joins up to which web address is the uh is dns and this is run effectively or governed by a body called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. They're really good at making these really catchy, aren't they? And ICANN is sort of quite an interesting organization. Its heart is often sort of in the right place, but it seems to manage to tick absolutely everyone off because they've got to decide things like who should I, who should be able to own a dot cat domain so should i be able to own one because i've got this guy here and publicly shame him for uh, for sort of hijacking videos with a you know james rbuk dot cat and i can't because the catalan region the 
Catalonian region of Spain has insisted that it's a geographic one and it's connected to that. More recently, uh, ICANN has had to decide who owns Dot Amazon. Is it, you know, the world's third largest company, Amazon.com, owned by Jeff Bezos, largely? Uh, or is it the countries or the people of that region of South America? And they did a big expedited procedure to decide who should have control of that. And after seven years, um, managed to decide that it should be the U.S. company. But DNS has security issues as well. Um, so that some of them that they're trying to fix. DNS is a bit more centralized than BGP and so more capable of being fixed. But just last year in 2019, we found evidence of a huge and incredibly sophisticated Iranian sort of DNS attack that was managing to redirect traffic of key targets and exiles and campaigners and journalists around the world to go to send data via its servers and to capture login details and all sorts of other information. Um, and so these sort of protocols, these things that are just meant to be, for most users, invisible and technical and boring, actually sort of not only govern how the internet sort of works in practice, but govern how vulnerable it is. And even as, you know, there's wealth in the billions being made daily on the internet, these seem to be getting a bit lost and seem to be falling apart in the middle. You know, it's a little bit like the vision some people set out of the US where you've got all this sort of private wealth in skyscrapers and then the roads and the bridges are often falling apart. But it's also arguably a power grab going on with these protocols. Um, I was always struck sort of after the financial crash, I should say the last financial crash, um, that often people try and hide power by making it boring or technical or making it seem not very interesting. And so, you know, who knew what a collateralized debt obligation was until it was too late or a synthetic CDS or any of the rest of it? We were sort of told it was the technical machinery that helped generate wealth. You know, we're often told that these protocols are boring and they're ground out over time. And a lot of these are now being decided increasingly by intergovernmental bodies. They're being taken on more and more by the big corporations that do it. But these are the things that govern what we see on the Internet and how it gets to us and what it's capable of building. And yes, a lot of the consequences at the moment are around security, but some of the decisions around these protocols have actually shaped the business model of the internet. And it's the business model of the internet that I think is even more interesting and significant in this particular moment than the stuff around, you know, the physical architecture of it. And one of the most sort of striking ones for me was when someone sort of pointed out that basically to do identity on the internet, it was really clutched on in the browser at quite a late stage, largely for e-commerce and for logons. And it's nothing in the protocols of the internet govern remembering who a user is or if they're logged in or say their bank or their card details. And the solution we came up with was largely cookies. Um, a website could put a small text file or similar into your browser, and it could look for it next time round. And all your computer sees is this little sort of fairly innocuous string of letters and numbers. But whichever website placed it can then cross-reference that to however much data on you it wants to store and it thinks there's value to it to store. Now, that sort of meant that all of that data doesn't accrue with us, doesn't sit with us, isn't part of some open protocol that can move around. It sits with the websites that we visit. And, of course, that's a huge part of what's created the sort of online advertising model that most of us, I think, despise. Um, and, you know, in the course of researching the book, 
I met someone with a very, very good claim to in, have invented programmatic advertising. And he's sort of, you know, he's made a lot of money by doing it, but was quite kind of riven with sort of mixed feelings at best about it, which was a comfort, I think. And it's because of this thing of it feels like as a user, like you visit a website and it gets a bit of your data and maybe the five or six companies that you see advertising to you on there also get a bit of your data. And maybe for you as a user, that's fair enough. Whereas what's actually happening is it is seeing it. Several ad networks are seeing it uh, that are much broader. But then once an auction happens, people sort of see your cookie and essentially get to cross match it to anything else they know. Have they seen it before? Do they have a clue of what your income group might be? Do they have a clue of what else you bought? Can they enrich it against some of their other data sets? And at that point, they will try and do a real-time auction across maybe you know a dozen, more than a dozen platforms that will then have hundreds of brands offering whatever they want for your cookie. And if that one brand knows almost nothing about you, they'll offer next to nothing. If they know loads, they'll offer loads. And so this means your data sort of everywhere, every click, every time you do it, is spread in sort of not dozens, but hundreds or thousands of directions with every single click. You know, we GDPR and all of the efforts like that to try and give us a sense of it just have absolutely no ability to respond to the scale and just become really annoying things that we click and close. But sort of that being the model has really come to screw over the people who create the content. And what was fascinating to me was sort of learning, you know, one of the most valuable consumers in the world is a regular reader of the New York Times. You know, it's just a good shorthand for someone who's got to be likely to be in a certain income group, be a certain type of consumer, be interested in a certain sort of lifestyle, and probably in business to have certain sort of power to buy. Now, in the pre-internet era, if you wanted to advertise to a New York Times reader, you had to advertise in the New York Times. These days, if you go to the New York Times, a ton of ad networks can clock this person goes to the New York Times. Some of them will be able to clock how often you go. And then they can wait a little bit later until you go to, you know, some sort of, you know, 17catfails.com or 23 celebrities you didn't know were fat in real life or whatever your own type of guilt content is. And that site still knows you're a New York Times reader and can get two or three times the ad value for you that it can from anywhere else. And so somehow the internet has managed to convince people who make stuff to give away their sort of greatest value, their audiences, their brand sort of um, prestige and spread it around the internet. And so you have this murky mess of an ad model that's then absolutely reinforced by a venture capital model that really only cares about the fact that the internet's a network and the internet eliminate, eliminates distance and almost every other barrier to scale. And once you sort of combine where how identity works on the internet, how adverts work on the internet and venture capital, you have an ultimate monopoly-making machine. And it's because, let's say in the real world, if you want to start a restaurant, no one's really got a battered eyelid. If you say, in my small town, I want to start a restaurant. I want it to be a decent restaurant. You know, let's say you, you're a pretty good cook or you're hiring a decent chef. You get a nice set of custom. It works quite well after a year or two. You're breaking even, start to make a little profit even. You know, you're quite happy with it. You might decide to open a second you know, he might even decide that, yeah, okay, actually, I want to be the next sort of Franco Manca or something like that. I want 20. 
no one says when you start a restaurant, if you don't have 500 or if you're not bigger than McDonald's in seven years, we're going to either have you bought out or shut down. And yet that's sort of what happens to anyone who wants to do venture capital. And almost anyone who wants to do a business on the internet ends up on the venture capital train. It is the go hard and go home of nights out. You know, you often sort of sometimes you'll go for a drink in an evening, have a glass or two of wine, go home. Lovely. Sometimes you'll think you've got to go out to do that and you find yourself dancing on a bar at 2 a.m. And it's happened naturally and it's fun. Go hard or go home usually ends up with someone throwing up in their shoes by about 9 p.m. and having to sort of beg a taxi to get them home. Um, It's sort of the same with venture capital. It wants you to grow and to grow and to grow because venture capitalists want an exit after seven years. The game isn't to get a steady, nice return on your investment. It's to make 10 bets, 20 bets, and hope one of them delivers a return of 50 times or 100 times. And so they want you to concentrate on scale beyond all else. Now, that encourages you to either, if you can, deliver a product for free, like Google or Facebook, or, you know, to some extent, uh, sort of many, many, many other sites around the internet, um, you know, including several of the ones that we're using to do this talk. The other thing it encourages you to do is to sell $10 for $5, as Uber has done, as um, uh, as Deliveroo has done, as many others have done. And that sort of determination to become huge really, really messes up the world uh, because, I mean, you could also see it as maybe one of very few successful transfers of wealth from the rich to the middle classes that we get. But when you're moving into existing sectors, you come in, you gut it, and then it either works and you raise your prices or you fall out having destroyed the value in it. Um, And as we move to the real world, as the internet sort of permeates and becomes ever more tangible, we see the consequences of moving fast and breaking things. But these three interactions, this sort of, are all sort of a consequence of network effects. And we can act as if that's something that we've never seen before. And that's complete nonsense. The internet has its own particular interactions and its own particular problems with it. And it's always going to be an ultimate challenge of them because the internet eliminates distance. You know, it eliminates travel time. It eliminates all sorts of barriers that often keep sort of things small or keep things local. And that can have huge advantages. But it's hardly the first technology that has used scale or has used centralization to as its core selling point. You know, when textiles moved from home workers to factories, that transferred a huge amount of power and control to the people who owned the factory versus the people who were the skilled textile workers. You know, when railways came in, they were a communications technology almost as much as they were a transportation one. But they also created hubs. They created specialization. They brought huge benefits. Industrialization created the modern world. But no one sort of would naively imagine that industrialization without huge regulation and huge legal action and huge public action would deliver its benefits evenly. I think for too long we've been naive about the internet as a technology, almost thinking of it as a you know egalitarian technology or a unifying technology, or even sort of thanks to the theory of the long tail that without limited shelf space, the internet would let niches rule, would sort of mean that dominant cultural things were less so, that, you know, small albums, small authors would do better. We sort of didn't end up thinking about its centralizing power, and we didn't end up thinking about the way that by nature of its lightweightness, it centralizes data and identity too. And so we have to sort of stop thinking about 
Mark Zuckerberg being a nasty man or Jeff Bezos being a nasty man or whichever one you pick, they're sort of products of monopoly making machines. And so we shouldn't just be thinking about splitting up Facebook. That's thinking way too small. Just as we didn't fix industrialization or the first Gilded Age just through antitrust, that was one tool in the arsenal. That was something that we invented. But industrialization brought about trade union movements. It brought about sort of rules on child labor. It brought about health and safety law. It brought about laws on the working week. It effectively started, uh, you know, and played a role in creating income taxes and welfare states. We actually changed the entire social contract to suit the technological era brought about by the Industrial Revolution. We're coming into a new technological era. It's maybe less different than the industrialization was from what went before, the industrial era was from what, what went before, but it's dr dramatically different. And so why do we just keep talking about four companies who are sort of floating on the surface of it? I would say we need a whole set of changes not all of which we will know the shape of right now, but we will need to go through a whole social process for a whole new internet era just to sort of deal with the real world consequences. What we also have to do this time that we haven't really thought about is look at the actual mechanics of the internet, the logical infrastructure behind it, and look and think about these protocols. And one thing that I would really like us to think about as we do that and try and keep us interested in it is how do we do things like move identity or move our social graphs into protocols rather than leave them with the platforms? You know, protocols let us go where we want to go. They keep us connected. They let us move around. You know, they form the backbone and the architecture of the internet. Platforms force us to stay in one place and do whatever the person running that wants. And so we need to sort of look at how we run the internet and look at how we run the real world and make the sort of new technological era sort of one that actually delivers the benefits, not entirely evenly, that'll never happen, but more evenly than they do now. And I think that's really possible. And I think that's probably slightly shorter than I said I would talk, but I think that's a good place to wrap. Wasn't that an excellent... Um talk everybody um if you'd all like to join me in thanking um james for giving such a brilliant talk um we're going to take a break now for about 10 to 15 minutes so we'll be, be back about 10 to maybe 5 to we'll put the time up on your screen so that you know you're not going to miss anything um keep asking questions in the slido we're getting loads of great questions um keep asking those upvote the ones you want to see answered um keep an eye on the chat we'll be sharing um links to james's book we'll be sharing links to the paypal and to the slido um, and we will see you very shortly after a break hello welcome back um, i hope you've had a chance to refresh your glasses i have had time to finish my pizza i'm very sorry about that um, and we're ready for Q&A, so if you'd uh, like to join me in inviting James back to your screens, um, and I will start going through some of the questions that we've had through on Slido. So the first question I've got is from Alec, who asks, uh, what should be the balance of power between the government's ability to censor speech and websites versus people communicating privately, tamper-proofly with each other? Um, I think... It's a much, much more sensitive debate than the way it's handled in public and certainly in newspapers. Um, I think government are trying to be to encroach when they try and go into what they say, even in WhatsApp groups and sort of forums like that. That feels to me like trying to regulate what people might say at a pub table um, and that sort of thing. And even taking out the technological intrusion of trying to get into end-to-end -end encrypted conversations and the huge negative side effects of undermining encryption, I think we largely, we regulate very differently, for example, what you can say, you know, on the BBC versus what you can spout off to someone in a pub. And there's all sorts of things you might hear someone at the next table say 
and you know start making some very very harsh judgments on them versus what you might think they should be thrown out for and so i think we've got a real struggle online in that there's lots of places that are private places and then if someone's get published we treat it like it's public but what's really difficult is we've got lots of semi public places you know your facebook wall if it's shared with friends of friends is quite tricky um you know what you say on a twitter account when you're 19 if it's suddenly pulled up when you're 28 and in a very different context i think is complex um i think we probably i i'm more relaxed with stricter rules on public sort of speech if they're set by government rather than by the social networks because then the government has to make it obvious they're limiting what you say what i don't like at the moment is that the government will pressure networks to say we don't want content that could do x y or z and the networks are left to interpret that and it lets the government sort of quietly knock it so i think firstly it gives them plausible deniability yeah, but essentially we end up with a soft encroachment of government onto private speech um so i think for very very public obvious online publishing you know we can set rules as the german government did fairly effectively with making its rules on holocaust denial stricter you know that i think works as it should i think private speech should be left largely untouched i think what the internet struggles with or what we struggle with is this sort of quasi private semi private are a bit muddy um and i think that's actually you know do we need to try and return a sort of you know a basis of ephemerality that that will disappear again and you know with some social networks that's exactly what they're doing um so maybe we're stuck in a sort of transit phase but working out what we do with that quasi public bit hello jamie <laughs> working <laughs> people have been going wild for the cats in the chat by the way i should should let you know that <laughs> it's it's uh, it's his favorite route through the hallway uh, <laughs> it's right it's under your nose little bit between me and the camera <laughs> he's he just likes the attention <laughs> um, working out what we do with that quasi public private bit i think is really complex um and i wish i had a better answer to that <laughs> but i mean that's that's the nature of the internet it's such a complex beast compared to we've got to understand like how it currently works and if we if we can't label how it what's private what's public and all of that then we're going to struggle yeah oh yeah <laughs> We've got a question from Rob who says, on identity, um, you say this should be in protocols, but surely this uh, is with your local provider, for example, your mobile phone or ISP, or at Google ID level. Please clarify. It's, um, I think there's different ways to do this. I think with Google ID, the problem is Google becomes the gateway to your identity, which gives more power to Google. Um, now, whether you could build it in at a browser level um, so that it at least came from you and sort of worked somehow there. That's some. That's a sort of solution someone explained to me once, although they didn't have a kind of full accountability and working of how it would go. Their sort of objection really to the current system was that if you use Google or Facebook ID, that becomes how you say you're you on the internet and becomes the gatekeeper and also gets all of the information from all of the surrogate sites too um you know including control of your payment information which then makes things sort of simpler for that site and sites in its network so it sort of helps you know create that kind of monopoly and so what they were you know the solution that they were looking for was something distributed in id could you have a, a protocol layer that actually handles that you know in the same way that we can handle sort of all sorts of other sort of exchanges etc you know that we handle dns that we handle this kind of stuff is there a way to put identity in that way i have no idea um, you know that but the other sort of fix that someone said was is if there was a way to build it in at least at browser level and pull it back somewhat from the sort of tech companies except of course they make a lot of the browsers so <laughs> an intrinsic fix but things like google id was actually what the people who proposed this to me were trying to move away from i should say this was actually 
pitched to me separately by two different VCs who were kind of going, well, I invest in companies that do, that do the current thing, but I think it's unhealthy for the internet. That's interesting, yeah. Um, so I've got a question from Skeptical Gumby who says, uh, what are your views on things like ad blockers and cookie auto delete add-ons, help or a hindrance for internet business? So Brian Kelly, who was the one who essentially, you know, in, has a claim to having invented programmatic adver adverts, uses an ad blocker. Uh, I work in the media industry and I use an ad blocker. <laughs> um, it's a good sign of how bad the problem is. Um, it does deny revenue to the sort of content creating companies that need it. Although you're starting to see sort of selective ad blockers more and more frequently that will allow through low sort of pressure, low invasion adverts and bar the kind of dodgier ones. Hopefully they'll serve as a pressure for actual underlying change on the mechanics to get an ad economy that is reasonable. You know, I think we've const we've tolerated adverts next to content since forever. Um, you know, we don't we might go and make a cup of tea during a TV ad break, but we don't regard it as a unfair trade off. And we pay, you know, we pay towards our TV. Um, so we can get to a point where there's a reasonable compromise. So the internet allows it to be so invasive and it, right in your face. That's sort of our way of going, hang on, you know, too far, guys. Like, yeah. if I load a web page and about 10% of the bandwidth is going to the content, which, I, you know, instead is now the only amount of screen that's left to it, <laughs> I'm going to push back and force you to be less crappy. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. We've got a selection of cookie questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to the next one. Um, Ed Edmondson asked, uh, "Do you think the EU cookie law has been a good thing overall?" I do not. Uh, <laughs> I, I think many people. I think it's that. something like one or two percent of users who ever do anything other than click allow all. Yeah, um, I click allow all every time, um, and then use a cookie deleter and an ad blocker. Yeah. Um, it has made browsing the internet more miserable and it really the EU fundamentally misunderstood how it all works online and what compliance would look like I think it was a really it's good example of well it's just got more annoying. terribly thought through law um, so no I've, I, I really can't think of an upside to it <laughs> can you see a way they could have implemented, implemented it better not particularly, but that's probably because I don't know enough about how to implement it. Um, and it's a lot easier to sort of sit at the side and go afterwards, yeah, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you've experienced those pop-ups so constantly. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think, I think essentially it was what I do think they did, and I thought this with foresight, not just with hindsight, was they were looking at the little bobbing bit of ice above the water and thinking that that was the problem. Uh, and, of course, as ever, it's the bit below. Yeah. Um, so we've got another question on, on cookies. Um, Dave asked, should there be more regulation around cookie acceptance and making it easier to decline cookies? So I guess this is kind of trying to fix the issue now we've – I liked it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can just fix it with consumer choice. I think the fatigue of just having to click and go through options for every site, you know, again, is it something that could be built into browsers? Is it something that you could set on normal expectations? But I think most of the engineering and most of the processing and most of the data analysis happens on the company side. And so I really think it's probably more about wider fixes to GDPR mm. that limit how much manipulation and analysis can be done of cookies, rather than throwing it all on us to decide which of the 76 cookies per website we authorize and why. I guess it's an interesting thing about the internet that we all use it, and yet to use it and to make decisions about things like, do you click accept for cookies? you have to have some level of literacy in it that most people, a lot of average day-to-day -day people just don't have. I mean, I, I think to really understand cookies, you would need a level considerably above what I understand on it. Yeah. And I've covered it for 10 years. 
written at least one book on it. You can't give people the choice to make <laughs> a decision on that. I think I know enough to go round and browse, browse. I don't know, you know, I might be unusually stupid and other people feel like <laughs> it. But I tend to think, you know, with tech stuff, if I'm not comfortable with it, most users won't be. Yeah. And then you've got, you, you can't put the choice on them because they're not making an informed decision based on... And also oh, wow. decision fatigue at the moment, if you're playing whack-a-mole with cookies, it would be all you did all day. It's a bit like, you know, courts. Every in, website, every courts time. In the UK have quite sensibly basically thrown out anything based on, well, lots of things based on user agreements on the absolute solid expectation that no reasonable person could be expected to read them. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Facebook's are longer than The Tempest. Um, and The Tempest <laughs> is short. <laughs> Uh, I've been using Facebook forever, and uh, I don't think I've ever seen them, let alone know how long they are. Um, Paul asked, although internet advertising is so prevalent, do sites such as Wikipedia show that free content without ads is a viable business proposition? So, um, yes, well, yes and no, um, in that uh, Wikipedia isn't a business proposition. Um, it does show there is another model. But Wikipedia, I think, is still one of the five most visited websites on the Internet. And, you know, Jimmy Wells, you know, very, very, you know, co-founder or founder, depending how you look at it, also has sort of a network of for-profit sites through fandom uh, that are wiki-based. And, you know, while while the other sort of dot-com founders have, you know, billions upon billions, I think he's got a 21-foot boat, which is a nice <laughs> You know, nice, yeah. I think Jimmy Wells is living in penury. He seems to have a nice life. But if you look among the sort of founders of the big sites, he's got a very different outcome to the others. Um, and I think it shows you can do interesting, public-spirited, huge projects on the internet. But it shows that at the moment you're sacrificing a lot to do it if you uh-huh. do Especially compared to the other people in, yeah. in a similar space, yeah. Yeah. We've got a question here. I've just decided to reload the Slido app, so I um, had a moment's delay. Um, from Igor, who asked, what do you think about the Chinese model of regulating the internet? Do you think other authoritarian governments are able to recreate it somewhere else? So, Igor, I know, is, is one of our attendees to our Zoom pub, and he's, he's based in Russia. So that's some additional so. context to that question. So I think, God, I could I could do another half hour on this one. Um, I think it's absolutely fascinating in a bunch of ways. China has done with technology what other governments have tried to do much less effectively with law. Like with what they've restricted in terms of how sites can operate and what they must do. And then with the great firewall, you know, the sort of DPI inspection and the level of technological insight they have into messaging in their space, they do have a very distinctly Chinese internet that's only very loosely connected to the global network. Now, to other extents, you can see that other countries have tried to replicate that. Um, Iran doesn't have many cable routes into or out of the country and essentially has worked to build a national intranet, more or less as a backup, so that it could essentially shut off the pipes to the global internet, but not have all of its key institutions suddenly unnetworked, as happened when Egypt tried to switch off the internet and realised it was screwing it. (laughs) Everything uses the internet. (laughs) A kind of national internet backbone. This is sort of what worries a lot of people. You know, it's sometimes called the balkanization of the internet or the fragmentation of it. And we could end up with sets of regional or national networks that don't really speak to each other. That would lose a huge amount of the upside and the potential of the internet, but it would let national governments have a lot more control over it. So uh, trust him to be a tart during my really serious. <laughs> um, but... Um, but you know, there, there would be a huge loss I'm a of back way this time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he likes doing this. He'll be a parrot for a while now. <laughs> but you know, this sort of fragmentation is is technologically possible, is politically possible, but would come at a significant cost. What's been really striking to me is the US's sort of aggression in almost forcing the acceleration of that. 
given the massive economic and soft power advantage and intelligence dominance it gets from the global internet. Um, it's absolute self-defeating insanity for them to be th- like doing anything to threaten it. And so, of course, they are. <laughs> and so I think it's very possible for other countries to follow the Chinese model. I just hope they don't. Because <laughs> we lose so much. Um, Chris N asked... What is your cat's name and can we see her or him? <laughs> you definitely can see one of them because he, uh, he does like doing that. It's, it's, it's a very famous. handsome boy. <laughs> yeah, but he's very aware of it. Uh, <laughs> he's Jamie and he's got a twin sister, Cersei, who is out of shot about six feet that way. <laughs> and have- just, just to assure everyone, they have been spayed. <laughs> We have had a lot of cat questions, so it's good that we get that out of the way now while the cat's sat on your shoulder. <laughs> and we've got a question from Marina who asked, uh, how do we make the internet more democratic? Um, I mean, I think Tim Berners-Lee's come up with sort of, and the people around his sort of consortium and the web we want are coming up with quite interesting proposals on that. I think what I would like to see is more work going on on making the protocols of the internet work for the 21st century, but work for people. I think a lot of what's going on at the moment is intergovernmental stitch-ups or sort of corporate stitch-ups. You know, you see some countries really like to suggest, you know, why don't we give the UN an oversight role over the internet? And, you know, the UN was born in an era of great powers, diplomacy, and it would hand a small handful of countries a veto power over fixing any of it. I think trying to give ways for sort of normal people to be involved in some of those processes, but also to try and find ways to let people who aren't super tech savvy involve themselves in those processes. I think when you can get them down to what are the trade-offs and what are the choices, you know, people can be sophisticated and people can be deliberative on it. And so what I don't want is only for the people who understand the technical details to... I think they should frame the debate. I don't want people demanding the impossible. (laughs) You know, it's not, you know, if you know technical stuff, stay in the corner and stay in your lane. Absolutely not. But I do think now it's this critical part of our lives. We have to not sort of just make it, you know, and and, uh, dominated by the elite of people who understand this stuff. (laughs) It's interesting you pointed out during your talk that um, you you compared it to the Industrial Revolution. I don't know if you've, how deeply you've looked into that comparison. It's hard to see history when you're in the middle of it. But do you think we're reacting to this huge technological change more slowly than we did with the Industrial Revolution or or roughly about the same and it's just going to take more time to get there? So my impression is more slowly. There's a really good short book on this um, by Tim Wu, who is an absolute legend in this space, but it's uh, The New Gilded Age, and I thoroughly recommend it. But um, I think more slowly because the problems are less urgent. Yeah. They are very, very significant, and they're sweeping across society. You know, the misinformation, concentration of wealth, tax, you know, how do we govern them, you know, We've never really had a a case where a company controlled by one person controls the information diet of 2 billion to 3 billion people daily. Um, But, you know, we had smog that was literally poisoning and killing people. We had poisoned water. We had people losing their hands, losing their livelihoods. And so I think you react more acutely to the urgency of the problem. But in the meantime, the Internet's evolving so very quickly. (laughs) So I feel we're reacting more slowly, but I don't think that's that means we're being stupid or we're being sluggish. You know, if you look out the window, there's a lot going on in the world. <laughs> and I can see why internet governance isn't quite top of the list. You know, maybe top three. <laughs> um, Cleo asked, do you have any potential new rules in mind as a parallel to the ones which came uh, in with the industrial uh, revolutions? Um. I'm excellent <laughs> jumping there. <laughs> <laughs> it's always great when they make a little hut when they land. Um, I think the main ones I would like to see, and it's easy to be glib about this um, and sort of go, oh, we should just have a data share or something like that. But I would like to see us really, really tackle data 
value from data and the ownership of it. Um, you know, I, I really dislike the phrase data is the new oil because, you know, oil is the sort of dead bodies of plant and animal matter. <laughs> so if data's that, what's in the pipes? And it's probably... <laughs> um, but I, there is argument that the value is created when it's processed and when it's made en masse and when intelligence is applied to it. You know, it's not just that it's being stolen from us, but you could similarly say that oil's worthless till it's refined and we don't tend to go with that argument. So rather than just this privacy idea, how do we share the value of it? How do we actually have ownership of it and sort of make smart trade-offs? And, you know, I think if we could work out something like that, either on a technical and protocol level, on a legal level, on a rights level, I feel then we'd be getting somewhere towards actually new kind of digital sort of legislation. I think that's one of probably dozens of things we need, but that's the one I've thought about. So <laughs> that one. That's your main answer. Excellent. We've got an anonymous question. I think this is the first anonymous question we've had so far tonight. Usually we get quite a lot of anonymous questions, but maybe people are feeling particularly sharing with their names today. Um, anonymous asks, have you changed your own habits to protect privacy? I see why they've got anonymous on this one. To protect <laughs> privacy from researching the book. So, um, so I mean, I I worked for WikiLeaks for about four or five months in twenty. Not just about the book. <laughs> and in twenty thirteen, I, I spent about a year reporting on the Snowden documents and had to move country twice. And we had GCH keys smashing up our hard disks and you name it. And so, I don't really have many habits left to change. <laughs> In some ways, you know, I probably browse the internet more openly and more normally than most people who've done those things, um, because sometimes it's about trying to hide in plain sight, and sometimes, you know, it's about knowing when to use which precautions. Um, and I always use at least some forms of encrypted communication daily, partly because, you know, my day job is working at an investigative journalism newsroom, and if you don't. <laughs> For anybody to see. Negligent these <laughs> so I actually didn't, but I don't think it's about us all suddenly trying to lock up our data and not participate. I think it's a little bit like climate change, and we shouldn't just think about it as, well, if we all took one less flight a year and turned our heating down, it would all be sorted. We need societal policy level, level changes, yeah. We need policy level change on this. But of course, individual people can research and make their own choices in the meantime. In the meantime, yeah. Just don't think there's a duty on anyone to try and fix it themselves. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, Chris N asked, "Is Tim Berners Lee right to be worried at how the web is being utilised and developed?" Yeah, and I honestly, I think one of Berners Lee's big fears that he publicly talks about is the web's disappearing in favour of everything shifting onto the platforms, you know, onto Facebook, onto even Google is sort of in, increasingly those little fact boxes and knowledge boxes. You know, if I Google Tim Berners-Lee now, I'm going to get his age. I'm going to get why I know him, all of that from Google. I won't even need to click through to click any link, yeah. site. And so even Google, which is the big tech company that relies on the open web, is starting to threaten it. Shut down, yeah. And so, yes, I think he is. But um, I think part of the problem is, you know, we haven't been forced onto those platforms. And so it's is it right to force people off them? Mm. Um, or is it about trying to make them question their choices and see the threats? Anonymous asked, different anonymous, I'm going to assume, um, what are the differences between the dark web and the deep web? Will the decentralized internet become mainstream down the line? So this is one of those that I start panicking about in case I misremembered the definition. <laughs> the, the deep web as I understand it, and I've never quite been certain whether this is one of those stats like you don't use 90% of your brain, but it's the idea that a large portion of the internet, and I've heard it said at 80 or 90% or more is unindexed pages that you can't find from search engines, et cetera. That's kind of the deep web idea. So it's there if you know what you're looking for. 
I suspect it's less of a thing than it used to be. Um, but we know that that's there. And some of it's just an artifact of how search engines operate, etc. The dark web is, a sort of, is essentially, usually refers to the internet through Tor. Uh, and it's a kind of decentralized sort of version. It more or less, this is an awful approximation, but bounce <laughs> traffic around to make it anonymous. And then there are sites that are only sort of hosted on that layer. Um, and it was an early kind of place for Bitcoin markets. It's probably most notoriously known for exchanges either of drugs, weapons. I think weapons was always overstated. And images of child abuse, very sadly. Um, unfortunately, it's also a fantastic tool for activists and for people in countries with internet censorship, with people. You know, I, I think it's sad that because it's slow, because it's difficult, because of its rep, it's struggling to pick up for the more for the legitimate uses and for the you know interesting uses it could have. Um, you know, I know for journalism and for whistleblowing, you know, the the dark web, which possibly needs a rebrand, <laughs> is an immensely useful tool. It's also slightly ironically it was funded by the U.S. Navy for a lot of its developments, wow. uh, which makes some people very suspicious of it but um actually a lot of internet secrecy stuff has been indirectly funded by the u.s government uh even as they condemn it <laughs> but um i don't think it will catch on vastly in the short run because i think if the web itself is in trouble the sort of spin-offs of it that are more privacy preserving but much less convenient will struggle even more um but I think it offers interesting technology and interesting possibilities, and especially if it got easier to use and some of the more mainstream applications jumped up. I think it's worth watching. Very interesting. Um, I get the dark and deep the wrong way around there. <laughs> calling me an absolute idiot and deservedly just, just make sure what just make sure you just google it just to be sure that <laughs> james has got those the right way around <laughs> i think you probably have um i think uh so we, i have somebody who's highlighting the questions so i ask them in the right order and they've now highlighted a question that i think tells me the answer to that question was a little bit dark um because the question they've highlighted is where did you get your round the twist t-shirt <laughs> I, I find it on the internet. I'm trying to remember where I got this one. I think we've, it was... had, we've had so many questions in chat, interactions in the chat asking about your T-shirt and your cap. It's like it's, um, it's, it's Firebox or I want one of those dot com. But I suppose I should show off. It does do. It does do that. Um, you are now responsible for the earworm that will be in everybody's head for the rest of the week. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it will be in my head too, if that helps. <laughs> I like that it encourages you to do a little twist when you see your friends, you know. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's brilliant. It is a great T-shirt. Um, we've got an anonymous question who asks, I've heard it said that using an ad blocker has become an essential part of keeping you safe from scams in addition to their ad original purpose. Do you agree? Um, yes, I do, actually. And it's largely because it's by their original purpose they do it. And it's because far too many mainstream sites allow their ad networks to show you cryptocurrency scams or insurance scams or all sorts of other like weird sort of get rich quick scams, binary options, uh, all of this kind of stuff. And I've found these on The Guardian, on The Mirror, on The Standard, on... And they do they do knock them out when you point them out to them. But if the adverts are going to actually leave you or your relatives vulnerable to being defrauded out of thousands, I think you are completely within your rights to block them. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they are an essential part of that. Um, another question from Chris. I think this is going to be our last question, possibly. I'm just checking. No, I've got a different question for you. Um, <laughs> as I say, I've got somebody highlighting these questions, so I know what order to ask them. Ask them in. They were a little bit slow on the uptake at that point. Um, <laughs> great. I'm going to blame them, not blame myself, obviously, because because that's what you do when you when you're on screen. Um, great. Asks how can we overcome the network effect? And um, there are protocol based alternatives to Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, YouTube, but the incumbents are household names. I mean, this is the several billion dollar question. And so I wish I had a good answer to it. 
Um, I don't. I I have what I maybe think is a first step, which is that if we get some of the protocols and sort of open social graph, open identity good enough, I think we should look at mandating them. You'd need to try and get, I mean, the difficulty is you'd need to try and align the EU and the US on it. Um, but if either the EU or the US require something, that's a block of consumers big enough that the networks cannot ignore them. And so if you said you need to open it up so that your users can connect at least in some way or move between networks and keep their social graphs, um, I mean, this could be immensely complex with GDPR, et cetera. This is not easy. But then you would at least make it possible for, you know, a rival might come that says, hey, we don't really want to be a social network itself, but we'll let you handle all your social networks in one place. You know, our messaging service will turn it into whatever the messaging format is and send it through to that network. So if it's a LinkedIn, if it's a LinkedIn contact only, it'll send it on email, if it's Facebook, Messenger, Twitter, DM, and they'll all come in and you could have one inbox. That as a competitor or as a service would be really cool. And at the moment, they ban you from having it by keeping you from being interoperable. So something that forced interoperability, I think, would suddenly really open up competition rather than these sort of very forced walled gardens so that you have to use the service in exactly the way they dictate. But that's a first step. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> first, I say a first step. It's the first absolutely mammoth leap. <laughs> It is. It sounds like everything to do with the internet is just, I mean, incredibly complicated because it's such an incredibly complicated ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, it's four billion people on a really complex set of layered. So that have all grown up organically and been yeah. kind of added it. And loads of these lower layers as well, which are sort of barely maintained or updated, and they're sort of got to fall over. There's a really good XKCD cartoon quite recently on this, where you know all of this monumental architecture of the internet. And suddenly it turns out no one's updated this brick since about 2008. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite scary sometimes, really. I, um, I, you know, it's my natural Yorkshire cheeriness. I'm, I'm really uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> you do sound incredibly upbeat and optimistic um, about it, which is not how many people I talk to about the internet tend to come across. They tend to be much more cynical and much more wary. I think it's bleak enough that you have to try and look for those sort of the, the little breaks in the cloud where the sun's coming through. So I think this is going to be our last question. And I do apologise to the person who I said it was their fault for not highlighting a question. It was definitely my fault. My internet didn't um, refresh properly. But let's, let's answer the last question um, from Chris who asked, what are your views as to why cat and the internet are so associated with each other. Did it start on chat forums when cats were often used as a white flag? Maybe I need to send a white flag to my... my <laughs> um, I think actually people sent them because that was the thing. I think cats were a good early common bit of ground. I think largely... And it said, as as a self-identified nerd, nerds like cats generally. Nerd, <laughs> nerds ID more with cats, are more likely to own cats, like them, find them funny. And so they became a very early language of the internet and a nice, easy sort of shared joke, tension breaker, as was said by Chris, or a sort of moment. I think there was a really interesting turning point on the internet, um, which actually only happened, I think, about... 2013 2014 or so and dogs overtook cats as the most popular animal on the internet <laughs> and this was sort of i used to work at buzzfeed and we discussed it like at far too great lens but we thought That's that was all great nerds would yeah <laughs> having definitely gone mainstream because you know dogs are generally the most popular pet and the most popular animal and so it was a sign that now it wasn't, you know, the, the nerds had there lost. Were more, there were more, more normal, normal yeah, people yeah. on the internet. You could speak had overtaken. And so cats have more hinterland. Cats are more baked into the deep internet, into the deep memes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I make a terrible anthropologist. <laughs> I think they're sort of, they've been there longer. They're still baked in. They're still huge. But dogs, dogs now are number one. Wow. Uh, and thankfully, both cats are asleep, so they don't. So they can't hear you say 
<laughs> okay, well, I think that's a great point for us to end on there. I'm hoping that you've all seen the doggy pop up that um, I'm sure one of the techs have put up when we were talking about dogs there. Um, thank you very much for such a great talk um, and for sharing your caps with us. Um, just to wrap up the evening, I'm just going to uh, cover a couple of quick things. So firstly, please put a massive uh, thanks for James in the, in the chat. Um, follow all the links to his book. Um, and we've also got links in there for PayPal um, if you want to support what we're doing. Um, also give a massive round of applause to our tech team who are fantastic. You will notice that this these events run so smoothly. And if you ever watch any other streams of anything else, they never run as smoothly as this. Our tech team are brilliant. So give them lots of thanks. Um, next week, we've got Izzy Lawrence, who's going to be talking about velociraptors and suff the suffragettes, which is going to be a fantastic talk. Um, and if you want to join us in the Zoom uh, pub, the Lockins Razor, um, we'll be heading there very shortly. And there'll be a link in the chat for you there. But until um, next time, uh, we'll say bye for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>